All right, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day, uh, busy schedules to be here. Uh, this is our the rainy season outlook for 2019. And my name is Robert Moyeda, and I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service Miami office. Uh, we are also joined today by the uh, South Florida Water Management, oh, sorry, South Florida Water Management District, and uh, Akeen Owashina is going to uh, come up after me and present uh, the outlook, at least from a, from a water management perspective. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, we'll start with a review, a quick review of the dry season, which ended on, of course, you know, we ended on May 15th, basically. Uh, most, areas, most areas had above normal precipitation, uh, not what I would consider to be slightly above normal. Uh, you see up there uh, about 10 to 20 percent above normal in, in, in most areas. And Akeen's going to have a little bit more information on that uh, when he comes up and, and, and gives his, uh, his part of the, of the outlook. Uh, th there were some pockets of slightly below normal rainfall in, in parts of southeast Florida, especially in Broward and Miami-Dade counties. But overall, there really weren't any dramatic departures one way or the other when you look at the, you know, at the big picture the entire season. Uh, there, we did have some, some spots or some times of the year when it was pretty dry, especially early on, like November, December. But January, especially the second half of January, we did kick in with some, with some increased rainfall, some systems that, that affected the area with some rain. So that actually put us above normal, and we were able to sort of maintain that, that level for the remainder of the dry season. Uh, it was warmer than normal on the average. Uh, and as we would typically expect during the dry season, especially when it's a non-El Nino, uh, or at least a non-strong El Nino dry season, uh, we had a you know, typically low number of severe weather days. I mean, we only had maybe a couple of days where we had some, some, some severe weather, uh, severe thunderstorms, heavy rainfall, uh, even a few tornadoes. But those were rather low in number, which is what we typically see during an average rainy season. I'm sorry, during an average dry season. Now, the rainy seasons did start, uh, you know, although the, the official date is May 15th, and that's what we started doing last year. We have a fixed start date for the rainy season, which is May 15th for Southern Florida. But the pattern began probably on May 1st. That's when we started to see uh, the daily showers and thunderstorms forming over the peninsula, uh, really, and kind of like, on, again, on a, on a daily basis, really, which persisted, has been persisting pretty much up to now. Although we are getting into a dry pattern now, which ironically enough, but we'll, we can, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. So uh, this is just a graphical depiction of the rainfall observed during the dry season. So the areas that received the higher rainfall amounts were along the parts of the East Coast, especially in Broward, or north, at least the northern part of Broward and Palm Beach counties, those areas, as much as 25 to 30 inches over that uh, uh, seven month period. And then about 15 to 20 inches. Again, those are not too far from the normals for that time period. And this uh, map shows the departure from normal or the percent of normal going back to October 1, which is a time frame that we can use to represent on, the, on these maps. The green areas were areas that were above normal, and the yellow and orange areas were areas that were a little bit below normal. But again, even there, you know, it wasn't by a huge amount. All right, so let's, uh, let's get into the outlook. Now, uh, just to kind of give you some general conditions, again, this is what we, what we normally see on most days during the rainy season. Uh, daily high temperatures in the upper 80s at least, and really many areas are in the 90s for on most days in, in the uh, rainy season. Uh, near constant dew points, which is a reflection of surface moisture. The, the near constant dew points in the lower to mid 70s, and sometimes they get up into the uh, upper 70s, actually, as we get later into the rainy season, especially uh, July and August, we can see many days with dew points up in the upper 70s. Now, does it doesn't mean that we can't see some periods where the dew points could get a little bit lower, but the average, the, the predominant pattern is for, the, for, for what we see here. And again, really, well, the reason we call it the rainy season is daily or near daily showers and thunderstorms uh, we see a lot that the pattern tends to be where we get a lot of uh, showers or thunderstorms over the water or in coastal areas in the night and morning hours. 
and then they and then they form over the peninsula during the daytime, especially during the afternoon, and sometimes lingering into the early evening hours. So that's the classic rainy season pattern for southern Florida. So uh, just uh, I mentioned this before, we last year in 2018, we, we decided to go with a fixed start and end dates for the rainy season. So it starts on May 15th and ends on October 15th. And this was based on uh, start, uh, art, and I shouldn't say, uh, subjective start and end dates that were determined over the last like 40 years where we used to actually, on every year, we'd say, okay, it looks like the rainy season started on this day. And then a year, the following year, it could have been two weeks earlier or three weeks earlier or three weeks later even. So the average or the median start and end dates are pretty close to those May 15th and October 15th dates. So that's what we decided is to go with, with uh, fixed dates. Uh, and this applies to the southern Florida Peninsula. So basically from about Lake Okeechobee, uh, that, that, that latitude southward, that's really what this mostly applies to. Uh, once you get north of Lake Okeechobee, then it's a little bit later onset and maybe a, just a little bit of an earlier end. So this is the time frame when, again, those, the moisture levels in the atmosphere increase sufficiently along with the warmer temperatures or warmer waters to support that daily or near daily showers and thunderstorms. Now, uh, it's important to note that most years, most years we have, it's more of a transition. It's not a, you know, where you just flip a switch and you go from dry to wet. Now this year, it kind of, it, it appeared that it did that, uh, especially right at the beginning of May. Uh, but now it looks like we're gonna, we're, we're going into this dry pattern that could last a week, if not even more, depending on, you know, how things uh, shape out. So again, it's not unusual, especially in the early part of the rainy season to have these, these transition periods or maybe, you know, wet periods, dry periods, a little bit more uh, interspersed before, it, the, before we get into the more daily kind of routine pattern. And the same happens at the, at the end uh, during, you know, in October. So the, uh, what we have here, this is a, a reflection of atmospheric moisture. So again, one of the, the key indicators of the rainy season or the hallmark of the rainy season, high, am, high atmospheric moisture. So the, the, the red line represents the average uh, atmospheric moisture content. And you see that the red line that I drew here is the beginning, roughly, the beginning of the rainy season. So you see how the, these, the red line increases significantly once you get into May and it stays fairly pretty elevated all the way into September and then it drops off in October. So, so that increase and in sustainment of those moisture values uh, during that, during the May 15 to October 15 period, again, that's you know, a representative of those conditions that we talked about. Uh, on even as early as the beginning of May, which is right about, if I get this out of the way, it's right about here actually, uh, are the actual values observed. These are averages. The actual values that we started observing were actually up in this range even as early as the beginning of May. So we were above the normal. So again, uh, in, an indication that the rainy season, at least the rainy season pattern, kicked in a little bit early this year. But now, as I mentioned, now we're going to get into a drier pattern. So we may see some of these lines, some of the actual values get down here below the normal for this time of year. So as far as actual numbers, so if you want to feel, so for example, if you want to know, okay, how much rain does Miami get, for example, or how much rain does Naples typically get during a, a wet season, these are the numbers right here. So the, these are averages over, you know, over a 30-year period. And uh, general ranges there on the right-hand side for different parts of South Florida. Uh, and the reason the rainy season is important, well, one of the main reasons is it's about 70% of our yearly rainfall occurs during that five-month period. So, you know, the dry season uh, is, is longer than the rainy season, but we get 70% of our rainfall during that five-month period. So it's certainly it's an important part of our, of our climate here, as well as our hydrology and our, and our water systems. Now, the thing, the, a, a typical rainy season pattern is for wouldn't say random showers and thunderstorms, but, they, but, but this not, it's not like uh, you have this, this huge weather system that's going to drop uniform rainfall across the entire area. It's, it's, more, it's more cellular in nature, 
where you have individual thunderstorms or clusters of thunderstorms. So you could have a lot of variation. You could have wide, wide variation in rainfall, even over relatively you know, small distances. And that's, that's pretty normal or pretty common uh, during the course of the rainy season. So, and that's one of the main reasons why long range predictability of summer rainfall is pretty difficult. And that's one of the things, of course, that we try to uh, depict or try to, to give you in, these, in this outlook, but we always throw that caveat in there because of that, the, you know, the, the, you know, the fact that most of this rainfall occurs from local, local weather effects, not large scale weather systems that would produce rainfall, more consistent rainfall over a larger area. Now, typical rainy season phases, and again, this, I, I emphasize typical, it's not always like this. Uh, the first six weeks or so, roughly, let's say mid-May, the beginning until about early July, maybe the first week or so of July, that's typically our stormiest phase or stormiest, stormiest period where we can have uh, our higher frequency of, of, of strong to severe thunderstorms with hail, even tornadoes, uh, flooding. And in fact, some of the weather that we had earlier this month was, was reflective of this, of this type of typical early season pattern where you still have the influence of the uh, of more mid-latitude weather systems, a jet stream, and those uh, systems that still tend to lag farther south uh, during the early part of the season. Now, once we get to uh, the mid part of the season, uh, July and especially August, we actually can enter into a little bit of a, of a drier pattern, especially July. That's more predominant in July, and that's also our hottest time of the, of the year. Now, once we get to the latter part of August, all the way until the end of the rainy season, that coincides with the peak of hurricane season. So that's when we could really have some wide variability depending on any tropical systems that might affect us, as well as any early season cold fronts or those early fall cold fronts that may start already start to get close to us by the end of the, of the rainy season, you know, late September and especially October. So one of the key indicators for, the, for any outlook, for any seasonal outlook like this one, is the, the phase or the stage of the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And this year, or this right currently, we have an El Nino. Actually, that's, that headline is incorrect. I just noticed that. El Nino is not on the way out. It's actually uh, here. I forgot to change that. I thought I had it. But anyway, let's ignore that for now. But, we're gonna, but these, these slides are OK. Uh, the El Nino pattern is here. It started, it, the, it started early, early this year. Um, those, each of those, um, each of these four uh, uh, graphics here represent the, uh, the sea surface temperatures over the equatorial Pacific Ocean, over these slices of the, of the equatorial Pacific. So the ones that we tend to look at the most for determining the phase of, of, uh, of El Nino is the 3.4 which is this one here, like in the middle, which corresponds to this one here. So the, these orange values show, uh, are, are, are showing value or water temperatures in that area that are above normal by just you know, between half a degree and one degree Celsius. So those warmer than normal sea surface temperatures in the, in the equatorial Pacific then lead to uh, variations or modifications in weather patterns, really not just over the Pacific, but across you know, most, of the, uh, most of the globe. So these, these uh, warmer than normal temperatures, or sea surface temperatures began, they, they, they actually began as early as last summer, but really didn't kick into what we consider to be the El Nino phase until really early this year is when it became more consistent across the board. Uh, this is the, these are the average anomalies or departures from normal for the April, uh, from April 21st until pretty much uh, just last week. Again, the oranges and reds are warmer than normal waters. So this is the area here. This is the area that we're looking at for, uh, to, to determine the, you know, the, the phase of, uh, of the ENSO. So certainly, again, again, warmer than normal El Nino conditions. Also, we do have warmer than normal waters over the uh, subtropical Atlantic. Uh, off, the coast, off the coast of Florida, up into off the coast of the uh, mid-Atlantic and northeast U.S., as well as uh, over the Gulf of Mexico. And that's not directly related to El Nino, but of course is a factor for local temperatures as well as, of course, once we get into hurricane season. 
So this is going back and looking at the different phases of El Nino or La Nina or neutral, going back to 1950, just to show that these are uh, normally these are uh, yearly patterns. In other words, when we get into an El Nino or a La Nina, for example, they normally don't last more than a year. They can sometimes last linger into a second year, but normally they they last about a year or so. So currently we're in this phase, this area, this this phase right here. Uh, the red and blue lines are the, the, the dividing lines of the uh, what we consider El Nino conditions in La Nina. So the warm phase, which is El Nino, is the orange line, and the cold water phase is the La Nina phase. So you can see how it's, it varies uh, from year to year, really going back to 1950 is when we were actually started to more closely study and have more uh, accurate, uh, more reliable measurements of the sea surface temperatures. So what's the uh, expectation for El Nino for the rest of this year, for at least for the summer? And into the uh, into the fall, the, the there is the, the likelihood is that the El Nino conditions are favored to continue through the fall. Um, the 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 chances do decrease some, especially as we get towards uh, September, October, November period. Uh, the probability of the El Nino continuing gets is uh, down to about maybe 55 to 60 percent. So between now and let's say August we're looking at pretty much 70% or higher probability. So again, so in other words, we're expecting these El Nino conditions to continue with a decreasing or diminishing chances as we get later into the year or into the fall, but still slightly favoring El Nino conditions. Um, for those of you that, that uh, are familiar with the spaghetti models, you know, we, we see so often when, we have, when hurricanes are out there, we have something kind of similar, but these, these lines or these uh, models or a combination of, of models are, are indicating what the, uh, what the sea surface temperature departure from normal is expected to be, or at least what these models are projecting it to be over the next, really for the rest of the year. And most of these lines are in that 0.5 degree above normal to about one degree above normal. So this is firmly, most of the, most of the models are suggesting that, uh, that, that this El Nino will continue. Um, and through the fall of 2019, again, uh, consistent with this here. Of course, as you go farther in time, uh, the confidence and the reliability decreases, but still favoring El Nino conditions. Now, another, uh, an important aspect also is not just whether it's El Nino, neutral, or La Nina, but how strong it is, how well defined it is. This one is what we consider to be right now a weak El Nino. In other words, the temperature departures those waters are not very or not extremely high or, or they're, not, um, they're not way above normal. They're just slightly above normal. And that trend is actually expected to continue. We're not expecting, at least the models are not ex are projecting uh, any really sharp increases in the sea surface temperatures over the next few months. So the likelihood is that the El Nino will stay weak. May, it might get into moderate phase potentially might for a short period of time, but looks like the predominant uh, strength should be on the weaker side, which you know, does play, plays a role as far as its influence on all the weather systems and just you know, the general outlook as well. So when we do these seasonal outlooks, these are some of the, the tools that we look at, at least maybe to help guide us. So we look at past years with similar long-term trends as we, what we call analogs. We look at some long-range models, and of course, uh, we, key, we do rely and we uh, are consistent with the Climate Prediction Center outlook, which is the official uh, long-range forecasting uh, agency of, of NOAA. And we also look at trends. In other words, what is, you know, what have, what's been the, the prevailing condition over the last 10, 15, 20 years? And for South Florida, that's really been mainly wetter and warmer summers. Not every year, but the, you know, the average of that 10, 15, 20 year period has been a, a trend more towards wetter uh, and warmer than normal summers. So you know, the, the analogs, I'm not going to go through this in much detail since the maps really aren't that easy to, to see, um, but the, the analogs, in other words, past years with similar conditions suggest maybe a wetter 
first half of the dry season, I'm sorry, wetter first half of their wet season, and maybe trending a little bit drier than normal in the second half. And again, this is not set in stone. It's what some of these past years with similar conditions are suggesting. Now the trends, as I mentioned previously, are indicating the opposite. And so trends are important. Uh, they're not the overriding or the main factor, but they're certainly one of the factors that we look at. So, the, so f as far as temperatures are concerned for southeast Florida, or really uh, going back to about uh, at least about 1980 or so, the general trend has been for, for, for higher temperatures, so warmer temperatures uh, during the uh, summer months. For, uh, for as far as precipitation is concerned, however, there is a, again, there is a slight tendency towards higher than normal uh, rainfall, but not as well defined as the temperature. So that's the temperature right there. That's the rainfall. You know, it's certain, it, it's above normal, above this, this red line, but not dramatically so. So there's, again, this a, a reflection of that variability in summer precipitation that can be hard to forecast ahead of time. For southwest Florida, for the interior and southwest portions of the state, similar pattern, warmer. Again, the trend has been over the last couple of decades or more of warmer summers, warmer than normal. And the precipitation, again, that same kind of trend. Above, you know, higher values, but not dramatically so. And again, with showing a high degree of variability from year to year. So, Putting all these pieces together, the outlook for the, for the summer, for the rainy season from the Climate Prediction Center is indicating uh, equal chances of above, below, or near normal precipitation for the, uh, really for the entire range of the, of the wet season with an increased likelihood of above normal temperatures. So the, the red, the oranges here are showing about a 40, 40 to 50 percent chance of above normal temperature. So if you consider the three different possibilities, either above normal, below normal, or near normal, you know, the, the highest of the three is for above normal temperatures, but there really wasn't enough confidence to go with one way or the other on the rainfall or the, or the, or the precipitation part of it. So that's why it's here labeled as EC or equal chances. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean near normal. It means that the confidence isn't really high enough to go one way or the other. And that's the August, September, October period. Same, pretty much the same pattern uh, across Florida and the Southeast United States. So translating this locally into our area, uh, the precipitation outlook for this rainy season is for above normal rainfall. And again, I think, uh, and, I, and I caution, and I, I throw in the word possible because we, the, the, the level of confidence that we can state in, in these kind of outlooks is limited. But it's possible based on those past trends and, 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 and past years with similar conditions that it could be a wetter than normal first half and then maybe more drier than normal periods in the second half. But this is highly dependent on any local tropical activity that could totally change that. So therefore, the confidence on this is low to medium at best. In fact, medium is probably stretching it. I'd probably lean more towards low confidence in that outlook. Now, the temperature outlook, we have a little bit more uh, reliability, a little more confidence there, medium to high, that we're going to end up with above normal temperatures. We saw the trends are pretty clear. The Climate Prediction Center outlooks are showing above normal. Uh, and I think that's going to be more reflected in the overnight and early morning temperatures, the so low temperatures. Uh, the, the warmer waters that I you know, showed uh, one of the earlier slides, that's, the, that's usually what tends to cause our nighttime temperatures to be higher than normal. So with that, you know, certainly above normal temperatures, there's a medium to high confidence in that. Now, the day-to-day -day variation in temperatures is not much in South Florida during, during the summer. We're not talking... 10, 15 degree differences from one day to the next. We're talking maybe four, three, four degrees, five maybe at most. Uh, but you know that's still noticeable, and it's still obviously something that we that we keep track of. Uh, so as far as impacts are concerned, this is what I will wrap up with before passing it on to Akeem. The historical severe weather peak for South Florida is May and June. So we are right now, we are in that historical peak 
uh, which lasts all the way through June. And some of the weather that we've had over the last few weeks since the beginning of May is, a, is, is, is an indication of that, where we have higher incidences of uh, lightning, uh, strong, strong and severe thunderstorms with, with damaging wind gusts, large hail, and even tornadoes. Now, it stays pretty high. The, the, blue, the black bars are the total number of severe weather events. It stays pretty high even all the way through August. So really, much of the rainy season, you know, we can have any of those conditions really at any time during that period. But highest frequency is May and June, and then still fairly high in July and then in August, and then starts dropping off once you get past August. And of course, we can't forget about hurricanes. Uh, the NOAA outlook comes out tomorrow, so I don't have any numbers to give you on that. That'll, that'll come out tomorrow. However, you know, one, of the, one of the things that I'm sure will be part of the outlook, at least part of the consideration uh, with, in the numbers that they come up with is, again, that El Nino phase. So El Nino, historically, at least typically, tends to increase the wind shear, or the upper level winds over the Atlantic, which does lead to less conducive conditions, again, we're talking on average. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have any storms, obviously. Even in the strongest El Nino years, uh, we've, had we've had hurricanes out there. Not maybe lower numbers, but they're still there. So, you know, and, and, and really the main thing that I want to point out here is that this does not significantly influence the likely areas of tropical storm hurricane strikes. I don't know if we really have that level of confidence at this point to confidently say, that, yeah, okay, it's an El Nino year, therefore uh, X area is more likely to be hit. I don't think we really have that confidence to, to actually say that or, or make it part of an official outlook at this time. Maybe, maybe at some point we will, but we're certainly not there right now. And again, the official outlook will be released tomorrow, so uh, stay tuned for that. And, you know, and, and, and this is probably one of the main messages that I, that we like to always mentioned with those seasonal outlooks is that they're not local they're not that's not a local forecast it's just a, a general outlook of how many storms are expected to form over a very large area extending from africa all the way to 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 the north american uh, continent so it only tells you a part of the story again there's no skill we have no skill in predicting individual storms uh, weeks or months in advance so that's our hurricane history basically there in that that map on the right that's a uh, uh, going back to 1865, the uh, hurricane tracks over South Florida. So just a reminder that we need to be ready every year. It doesn't matter if it's El Nino, La Nina, or, or a neutral. We've been hit by hurricanes in, 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 in years with strong El Ninos. We've been hit by hurricanes in, in years with La Nina. And we've been hit by hurricanes in years of neutral conditions. Uh, the, the typical or primary hazards of the rainy season are, as I've mentioned already previously, lightning. Uh, we, unfortunately, we average two deaths and nine injuries from lightning in South Florida every year. It's an average. Hopefully, those numbers will be zero, but it's, it's something that we, can, uh, that we uh, are usually, you know, we're always concerned about. Tornadoes and, and severe thunderstorms, we mentioned the peak of the season, really May and June, but still high values typically through, all the way through August or higher than the rest of the year. Uh, with, of course, increased rainfall, it's normal to expect increased flooding and flooding events. So we, uh, on a yearly basis, we average about eight to 10 flood heavy rain events in South Florida that actually cause impacts or damage. And most of those are during the rainy season. And even water spouts. Uh, just during the rainy season alone, we average about 25 to 35 of those over, over our waters, both on the Atlantic and, and Gulf coasts. So, you know, always some good uh, safety tips for these different hazards. Tornadoes, of course, tornado warning means take action. So take shelter. Uh, nowhere outside is safe, obviously, when it comes to tornadoes. You know, we've seen pictures here or, or video over the last couple of days in the, in, out in the uh, Midwest there we've, we've had some, some uh, we've had a lot of tornadoes there the last couple of days. We've seen all those storm chasers out there. Uh, you know, just take, take shelter when tornado warnings are issued. Uh, lightning is a more common threat. You, we don't need a severe thunderstorm in order to have lightning. Lightning occurs with any thunderstorm. So again, same, same general advice with lightning, go indoors. 
uh, no safe, there's no such thing as a safe outdoor place from, from lightning. So when thunder roars, go indoors. That's the, uh, the lightning safety motto that we use. And Florida, as you know, in case of, we need to be reminded, leads the country in lightning strikes and because of that, unfortunately, lightning related deaths and injuries. Uh, flood safety, uh, South Florida flooding is often dangerous and it's also often deceptive. We don't have rapidly moving water. Our, most of our, our flooding here is primarily ponding of water. It just accumulates gradually over a period of you know, time, but it's still deep enough that in some cases it, it could, it could you know, uh, not only lead to car to vehicle stalling, but if it's even high, if it's, if it's especially high, cars could even be moved or, or cars could actually start, you know, get displaced. So we don't want to underestimate the power of the water. Now, the other rainy season hazards that are, co or, or the coincident hazards are hurricanes and tropical storms, which we've talked about, um, rip currents and heat. Now, I do want to talk about heat and rip currents, especially because I think it's going to become more of a story in, in the southeast U.S. and Florida here over the next uh, few days as we're expecting temperatures to increase quite a bit, more so north of South Florida, but even we're, we may feel some of the peripheral impacts here in South Florida as well. Uh, just an average day, it's just, you know, like I said, you know, mentioned before, average high temperatures in the summer can reach or exceed 90 degrees on most, most days. And th those temperatures are dangerous, especially inside vehicles. You can see there in that graphic, even with an 80 degree temperature outside, which is, you know, a morning temperature maybe in the summer, car, cars can, or vehicles can reach uh, temperature or can exceed 120 degrees inside of a vehicle in, in basically an hour. So unfortunately, there, we always hear cases of, uh, of children that are left in locked vehicles and pets as well uh, dying because of that. So we want to make sure that we you know, help get that message out about checking the back seat, making sure no children or pets or anyone else is back there. Or never leave children or pets unattended in vehicles. Rip currents. Uh, rip currents is rip currents are the number one weather-related killer in in South Florida. And this weekend, with with Memorial Day weekend, we have a lot of visitors. A lot of people go to the beach for the for the holiday weekend. And unfortunately, it looks like we're going to have a high risk of rip currents as well. So we're going to have the combination of a lot of people at the beach. Uh, nice mostly dry weather and the conditions that are uh, conducive for rip currents to form we're talking primarily the atlantic beaches uh, the gulf of mexico beaches should be okay i don't don't expect uh, a high risk of rip currents there however on the east coast it's another story with the onshore winds we're expecting this weekend the dry weather the hot temperatures people are you know and the number of, of visitors and locals even that go to the beach during that holiday weekend uh, this is something that we're particularly concerned about. I mean, we're, we certainly, we're, we're going to increase our messaging here over the next couple of days, and we're using this platform here to help get that, start getting that word out as well, especially as we head to Friday and all the way through Memorial Day itself. So, you know, we, we, always, uh, we always recommend that people uh, swim at guarded beaches, in other words, within sight of a lifeguard, and to heed those flags. So, if there's a red flag at a lifeguard stand, that means the rip currents are there, are there. Not only are there rip currents there, but that they're especially dangerous or strong rip currents on that day. Lifeguards make a daily assessment, and actually several times a day. So we need to make sure that we heed uh, the advice of lifeguards and uh, pay attention to those flags and, uh, and other uh, warning, si uh, warning uh, signs or symbols out there. All right, um, I'm going to... Um, maybe we have time for a couple of questions just about the weather part of it before I pass it over to Akeen. So are there any? Yes. Yes, Jenny. So 2016 was the last really big El Nino. Can you compare like what you might, how this year might look compared to that? Since that's what yeah. Like yeah. Well, it was, yeah, the, the, um, yeah, the 2015, the 2016 period was, that was a, a, uh, uh, strong El Nino, but it was more concentrated during the winter, during the fall, winter, and spring, not so much during the summer. It, was, it peaked in the winter, and that's we, we had uh, a lot of severe weather. And we had, even had a couple of tornado outbreaks in the winter of 2016. Uh, 
So, but, you know, but, but by summer, it kind of dwindled. That's usually what happens. The El Ninos tend to reach their peak during the early part of the year and then you know, tail off or diminish some, although they, they still might linger in, into the summer. So the key for this year, again, is going to be how, how much, you know, how, how uh, present it will be. In other words, if it's gonna stay on the weak side through the rest of the year or, or, might, or might it get a little bit stronger. Than, than, than expected. Those are, those are things that we're gonna to have to look at, not just for local uh, weather impacts, but especially for hurricane season in general. Okay, any other questions either on the phone or those here in, in the room? Um, Rob, uh, Dave Flesher, because I'm Daniel, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, the uh, gradually increasing temperature trend over the past 10 years, would you, is that a symptom of climate change? Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's consistent with the trends observed, you know, not just locally, but in, across the United States and really probably, you know, w worldwide. So it's, it's, I would say it's consistent with that. You know, I think we do have to factor in also um, urbanization, especially in area, you know, metro areas like, you know, like, like southeast Florida. Um, urbanization does play a role as well in, in, in temperatures increasing. Okay, thanks. Any, any other questions? All right, I'm going to go ahead and pass it now to Akeen, and uh, I will go ahead and switch the presentation here to make sure. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> uh, my name is Akeen Owoshino. I'm chief of the Hydrology and Hydraulics Bureau at the South Florida Water Management District. Uh, I'll be talking to you this morning about the uh, giving you a water condition summary across the district. Uh, but before I get started, I'd like to thank the National Weather Service for putting together this event and for having us here. Uh, it's great, always very informative. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I assume many of you know about the district, but I think I'll spend the first three slides to plug us. Uh, we're the South Florida Water Management District. We've been around for upwards of 70 years. We're the largest of the five water management districts that span Florida. Uh, and our area of coverage ranges from uh, to the north about Orlando, extend all the way to, down to the Keys. Uh, we serve a population of about uh, 8 million people, a little bit more than 8 million people, cover a region of about 18,000 square miles. And uh, in that region, we're responsible for water management uh, across the, the 16 county region that we serve. Uh, and the key elements of, of our, our mission include safeguarding and restoring uh, the, the uh, re water resources and ecosystem, providing flood control uh, to the communities and the people that we serve, uh, and meeting the region's water supply needs. Uh, we go about that by implementing and operating one of the most uh, uh, intensive uh, flood control systems in the country, uh, the South and Central, uh, Central and South Southern Florida project, and and that uh, set of infrastructure includes more than 2,000 miles of canals, uh, more than 2,000 miles of levees, uh, hundreds of water control structures and pump stations, and we have uh, storage areas, uh, large storage areas uh, that. that uh, hold water to treat them as, as they are released into the Everglades. But uh, these are all the assets that we have and that we operate uh, to, to provide flood control or flood protection within the A region that we serve. One important thing to note, though, is as extensive as our flood control system is, uh, it is only part of a three-tiered system that's needed or necessary to be working well to get flood control for the populations that we serve. Uh, the primary system is the piece that we operate, uh, built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, jointly operated by us and the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, but there's a secondary system uh, that discharges into the primary system uh, that's operated by municipalities, uh, special water control districts, uh, and, and other governmental type uh, agencies, as well as the tertiary system that's run by homeowner associations and, and individual landowners. All three tiers have to be working well together uh, for the flood control system to be working well together. Uh, and and uh, just to round that piece of my, my presentation uh, off, I want to just kind of stress this commitment that one, 
Uh, this is a year-round commitment for the Water Management District. Uh, a colleague of mine usually jokes that in South Florida, you don't have a dry season and a wet season. You have a wet season and a wetter season. And so the flood control mission is something we're always thinking about. Uh, it's 24-7, 365 days for us. And this is also a shared responsibility. Uh, the uh, efforts we go through relies heavily on a lot of coordination and commitment with organizations such as the Weather Service, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the special districts. We talk to everybody. We work with everybody to make sure we get this right. So uh, what has the system been like uh, over the last year? Uh, how we set up uh, for the uh, upcoming wet season? I'm going to say a few things uh, just based on, on, on uh, some of the things that Robert said. Uh, but what I'd like you to take away from this graphic is that where you see red, it means that we had less than what we typically get in that particular month. So if I pick the month of September, for example, in 2018, uh, we should have so much rainfall, we got two inches less than what we typically would have. This is across the district. And if I pick January of this year, uh, the light blue is what we typically will get on average. The dark blue shows how much more we got over what we should have. So for the dry season that has just passed, uh, starting from October, November, you'll see that we had many months uh, that were below average. Uh, but we ended up having a number of months, January and February, and, and this May that just started, uh, that, I, uh, that ended up above average. And the reason I'm stressing this is that even when we do talk about an average period, uh, you could have parts of that average period that's not average. And, and when you're dealing with flooding, you, don't need, you only need to have a really particularly wet period for a short period, and you're addressing a flooding concern. It could happen in the dry season. So, uh, especially, the rainfall we get, I've given you how it, distributed, how it was distributed over time, but it also matters where it, where it fell uh, in any particular month. And so what I'm showing here is for the dry season defined as November through a couple of days ago, uh, what we've accumulated for that period. And uh, even though you had periods of dry and wet, we've ended up roughly just a little bit above average. Uh, the, the regions along the, the East Coast uh, had some areas that were, I think Martin County was about 102% of average, just about 2% over average. Uh, but the, A, the EAA, the central or the western portion of the EAA, had about half again as much rainfall as typically they have in the, in the uh, dry season. Uh, with 145% of normal. Uh, but all in all, we've had these dry months and then a couple of wet months, and the overall distribution is, is something that's roughly about average for the entire dry season as, we, as we've seen it. Now, with the rainfall in hand and knowing that our system is rainfall driven, I'm gonna go from north to south through our system and describe the state of our, our, our key water control assets or infrastructures in that area, the storage uh, the lakes and, and the water bodies that provide storage. Uh, in the northern part of the system, uh, this plot or this graphic shows you three of the key lake systems. And what I'm showing with this graphic, the red line represents what we call the schedule. And I'll describe that a little bit because it helps understand how we move water. Uh, the red line is the line above which, uh, if the water level gets, we'll try to operate to get back below the, the schedule. And in the winter, we hold it high because uh, it's the dry season, you want to get as much water and keep as much water as you can. It helps with water supply. Uh, in the wet season, in this part of the system, you want to have a summer pool that is lower because you want to leave as much storage as you can within the system to take care of the rain that falls so that it's not on people's yards and homes. It's, there's a place for it to go to. So looking at these uh, three lake systems up here, uh, what you see with the green and blue line is that the water levels within the lake systems are doing just what we need them to be doing right just about now. They are receding towards the bottom of that schedule. And on June 1, uh, the goal is to be at that low point. Uh, after June 1, as the rains come, we know that the nature will drive the water levels up and, and it will do what it needs to do, but we'll do uh, whatever we can to keep it below schedule beyond that. So this part of the system is well set up. Uh, the water levels are where they need to be. Uh, we're, we're keeping an eye on it, but uh, things are good. Uh, uh, the outlook for the wet season is good in this area. 
Moving down to Lake Okeechobee, uh, the track or the trace that I want you to focus on right now is the darker red trace. If I can move the mouse, yeah. Right there that says 2019. It shows you what the lake is doing. And it shows that as we went through the end of the dry season, we went through a, a recession. This is what you'll expect to see, lake levels dropping. Uh, and in May, with the rainfall that we had in May, in early May, you saw that that recession stopped. There was a reversal, and the lake level is beginning to rise again. Uh, again, the system is responding to rainfall. Uh, that's what you expect to see. Uh, but I also shared many tracks, or many traces on this graphic for many different years. And if you look at the trace in green, this, this light green line, uh, this was 2017. And 2017, by June 1, we're roughly below 11. Uh, we had a wet June, and it shows in the rapid rise in the lake level. And then we had Irma uh, in, in uh, I think that was in late September. Uh, and and uh, or was that early October? I can't quite see that particular graphic well, but it was September. And what you saw was that the lake level rose by upwards of three feet in one month. So. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to conclude my presentation by saying that we're set up nicely, uh, but you must remember that in South Florida, it just takes one storm uh, or uh, lingering uh, rainfall event, and the situations could, could reverse. But for right now, the lake levels are relatively low. Uh, the, the suggestion is we have a wet system, an average wet year. We're set up nicely to deal with it. There's, there's storage. Uh, the second question that that would leave then, is it low enough and is that, a, is that an issue for water supply? And at this time of the year, entering the wet season, uh, having levels like this are not quite as concerning. We know that if we have a particularly dry start to the wet season, we could drop uh, into water shortage. But if, we, if, if what we saw in the early May is a, a harbinger of things to come, then we may be in a good place for water supply as well. One of the tools we use and that we run every month is what we call the position analysis. Uh, it's, I heard uh, Robert use spaghetti plot. I guess this could be a version of the spaghetti plot. What it does is it takes the condition of the system at the beginning of any one month. This was done for the month of May, and then applies the weather, uh, the climate, uh, for a 41-year period to that state of the system and tries to tell us where things might be if we had weather similar to what we've had any time over the last maybe 41 years. And the way you'd read this graphic, or the way we, we read this at uh, the beginning of May, was that uh, there was a 50% or an equal likelihood that we would fall below the water shortage line sometime in the June or July time frame. And we start preparing for that possibility. Now, the good thing was that in May, uh, we didn't, things just keep, didn't, stay dry, it actually bumped up. If you look at the graphic I showed you earlier, you see this lift here? If you go back, that would put us on a different trace. It wouldn't be on this red trace, which was the average trace. It would be on a separate trace, which might mean a lower likelihood of going into water shortage. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, at the same time, we look at this graphic, and we look at the likelihood of being at extreme high levels within the lake. Uh, and again, depending on what you have with rainfall, there is a possibility that we could get to extreme high levels, which would necessitate discharges from the lake. Uh, the Corps of Engineers, who's responsible for doing lake operations, we share information like this with them. We give them the signs. Uh, they make all the relevant decisions in consultation with the members of the public and us about lake releases. Going further down into the system, uh, we use tools such as this uh, that look at the ability to convey water, this traffic light tool is one of the tools we use uh, on, a, on a weekly basis uh, to make decisions about where water goes. Uh, but the key thing I wanted to, to you to take away with this particular graphic is the schedule for the water conservation areas, which are the major storage facilities uh, uh, south of, of Lake Okeechobee. Uh, these are also natural areas. They have their needs. There is a particular water level that's, that's appropriate. Uh, for this region, so there's a schedule that determines what that needs to be. And what these schedules show is that water conservation area uh, one, which is up here, uh, is above schedule right now in response to the uh, May rainfall. And, and so we're going to kind of manage and watch that carefully and manage what goes into it. Uh, water conservation area two 
uh, was below schedule, but with the May rainfall, it's kind of ticked up just right above that schedule line. Again, uh, the, the core is managing discharges from that, and, and we're paying attention to that to keep it around the schedule. And Water Conservation Area 3 right now is below schedule, uh, which is a, a good rest for this uh, particular part of, of the system. Uh, with that said, uh, we use tools that are provided by others, uh, such as the uh, Climate Prediction Center, to look at what the long-term projections are uh, for, for uh, rainfall within the region. And as, as, as Robert mentioned earlier, uh, there is equal likelihood uh, of, of uh, uh, below average, average or above average rainfall looking into June, as well as looking into the, the three-month increments uh, through the rest of the, of the uh, uh, wet season or the rainy season. Uh, if we get average conditions, then it's a good thing. I think we're set up nicely to deal with that. But as I noted in the, in the bar graph I showed you, you could end up with average conditions uh, over the entire season and still have a terrible month. So we keep, uh, we, we keep focused on this. We look at both the long-term projections as well as short-term projections such as this uh, done by our climatologists and, and uh, our meteorologists. And, and, and uh, we, we use all of this information to guide uh, short-term operational strategy as well as a long-term operational strategy for, for the entire uh, flood control system. So uh, what I've shared with you to this point is the state of the system. Uh, I'd like to kind of end up with how, what we've done to prepare uh, for the season. Going into the rainy season every year, uh, the district goes through a number of activities. Uh, we exercise the Emergency Operation Center, our EOC, and our field stations. And so this year in April, we went through a Hurricane Freddy exercise. Uh, we had folks who would normally man the EOC during an emergency go through a drill, uh, test how, they might, how we might respond to some uh, uh, designed uh, uh, emergency uh, event. Uh, we also tested our field station. We had different exercises for those groups to make sure that the folks who you'd see out in the field are also ready and, and prepared. We do what we call a full mode switch test. Uh, that is where we take the, the uh, regular tools that we use to operate the, the system, the, the uh, cell towers, the, the uh, West Palm Beach headquarters, and we isolate that from the system, and we run our entire system from a backup location in Fort Lauderdale to make sure that everything is working if we were in an emergency situation that renders one location uh, unusable, that we can still operate the system and still provide flood protection to the people we serve. Uh, we tested our communication process. I mentioned earlier that this was a three-tiered system and that uh, success of the flood protection system is geared on all parts of the all three tiers working well. And so we tested our communication with the 298, the special districts. Uh, we had phone calls with them. Uh, we made sure that that piece was working. Everybody uh, got together, talked through what the strategy may be going into the wet season. Uh, and, and that's on its side. And we've, we've uh, ramped up our communication uh, with the various local governments uh, and, and the uh, internal groups uh, that have to make water uh, supply decisions and, and water uh, flood con protection decisions. We've been uh, amped up the conversations we're having on general strategy going into this wet season based on the information we have regarding the outlook. So where we feel right now that, that we're set up nicely, uh, I, I think the, the way this dry season evolved uh, have, have really put our systems in a case where they have, we have adequate storage to deal with the, the uh, typical rainfall we might expect. But we do understand that we're in South Florida and it only takes one, uh, and it takes just one place in the wrong place, and we could be dealing with something different. So we're, we're uh, ready, working hard all the time, we're paying attention, and, and uh, uh, we're working with all of the partners we need to work with uh, to make sure that we're ready to respond and serve the public we serve. And I will be glad to take questions. Yeah, well, you don't have to be ready for all three. You have to ready for the, be ready for the bad outcome. Uh, if you are ready for the bad outcome, then you are okay 
for the for the decent and good outcome. And and I'm a, I'm, I'm a hopeless optimist. People who know me will say this, because when you say there is an equal opportunity for dry or average, that's 66 percent chance that I'll be in a good place, and there's only 33 percent chance that I'll be dealing with something bad. And you plan for that uh, that uh, undesirable outcome, and you hope for the better outcomes. Uh, very good question. Uh, and I will go to a backup slide to show you some things we typically do. Can you repeat the question for the people on the phone? Yes, I will. Uh, the question was, if there is an imminent hurricane, how far in advance do you start uh, taking action? Well, how quickly do you start draining canals or the actual questions? And there are a number of things we do ahead of a hurricane. And, and uh, uh, this slide that I had as a backup slide just kind of shows some of the pre-storm activities we have. Uh, regarding your question specifically, it depends on, on the projections for the storm, where it's likely to come through, and how quickly it's moving. Uh, but usually, we ramp up our readiness. The moment it, it's observed, uh, there are a group of people who start watching it very carefully. Uh, start looking at where within the district it might come, looking at what assets are in the way and how nimble those assets are. If, it's, if we're looking at an area where uh, if the projections are in an area where you can't move things around slowly, you might start taking some actions a week in advance of something happening. Uh, but if in an area where you can be very quick and you can take action and get a response quickly, you might wait a little bit to be more certain that it's on a path to get there before you take action. But whatever the case, there's a balancing act we have to manage. If you take action prematurely and you do not get the storm, you could lose a lot of stored water, which could have an impact on water resources or water supply down the road. So there's this balancing act that a team of people at the district kind of watch very carefully. And then we just ramp up our activation as we get more certain uh, of an event. But the kind of things we do, we, you mentioned uh, maybe lowering canals. Uh, sometimes we let water out of storage. We have what's called the A1 flow equalization basin, which is an area that takes some of the surge. We might empty it. Uh, we might operate things just a little bit differently uh, to make sure we have capacity if we get the rainfall that comes with the storm, if it's a wet storm. Uh, but those are some of the kind of things we do, and the time really depends on the characteristics of the particular storm. Uh, the, the, uh, the Lieutenant Colonel uh, at the call, Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Reynolds, has uh, answered that question, and she does it very well. Uh, and, and so I wouldn't want to necessarily speak for her, but I'll paraphrase as best I could, that they were not trying to get to a particular target, was what she mentioned. Uh, and, but they were trying to operate, looking at the lake and what the lake needed, and looking at their stories and what they needed within the current authority that they had. But I would... Uh, recommend you give uh, Lieutenant Colonel Reynolds a call. She answered that question beautifully. So. Well, okay, so then I guess my question is getting it, it, it at 11 and a little over 11 feet max, mm -hmm. do you feel like that's, that's low enough heading into the wet season? season? Yeah, we, we, right now we're set up nicely. It's low enough uh, that if we get uh, some rain, there's a place to park the water without having to discharge uh, at a high rate to the estuaries. Uh, and the rainy season usually dictates what happens in the lake, uh, hard as we might try. There is more water coming in than we can, we can put out. So if it starts to rain a lot, it will go up. Uh, and, and then at that point, uh, the, the core working with us and others would make the best operational decision based on the, the current uh, lake regulation schedule. But it's, it's in a good place for whatever reason, the weather, the actions of the core, uh, the fact that the lake's low right now and things are beginning to get wet uh, means that from the flood control end, there is a place to store water, and from the water supply end, if it continues to rain, that we may not get into a shortage condition. So uh, it's set up nicely. Right. Any questions from the phone? Okay, right. Robert. Any questions for Robert? Yes. Right yeah, talking back to you. Yes, I, yeah, I'm here. Um, so you had mentioned the warming trend, the summer warming trend for the, what did you say, 10, last 10 to 20 years. 
Do you have any numbers on that, like the, that show the trend that you look at? Well, the, the, that, that graph I showed in my, in my presentation did, did have some it, it did some of that, did have some of that. Now it's, I know it's hard to, uh, okay. it, it's hard to visualize. I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna see if I can, I'm gonna see if I can bring it up really quick. Uh, probably not gonna be able to give you an exact answer, but at least maybe you can. If you're if you're viewing it, you can visualize it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes. Yeah. You can see here, for example, this is Southeast Florida. You can see that the the blue line is let's say uh, an average over that time frame. 81.2 degrees. So, you know, um, some of those looks like, especially towards the far right there, it peaked there a little bit above 83.2. So, you know, for that one particular year, <clears throat> it was two degrees, <clears throat> I'm sorry, two degrees above the average for that time frame. So that, that at least gives you some kind of a sense of, and I can give you like an actual a number or by how much. This is pretty good, thank you. And what's the gray line? Okay, the gray line or the gray line or the actual those are the actual yearly values. The um, the red line is a moving average. I think it's I think it might be like a five year moving average, whereas the gray lines are the year to year variations. So in other words, we're capturing not just year to year trends, but also uh, trends averaged out over a slightly longer time frame. Okay. Any other any other final questions or comments before we wrap up? All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be available, and I'm sure a keen as well for any one one-on-one -on -one interviews if you want to do them. So again, thank you very much, and uh, have a great day.